I'm just going to talk a little bit about how you can actually build a communication strategy on hope. Um, and it's inspired by Catherine's book, but also by the latest findings from neuroscience and cognitive linguistics and Amnesty International's own audience research. Um, and I should say right at the start, as someone who's Irish and Jewish, optimism does not come naturally to me. Um, <laughs> but what I, what I also get from that experience is knowing that human rights is too important not to do whatever it takes to win. And so hope-based communication, as I'm calling it, is really actually about making the case for human rights-friendly policies in a way that wins the debate. And it's about changing attitudes, uh, triggering the right response in our audience so that we change attitudes. Um, and so Amnesty International may actually have a new communication strategy called Making Human Rights Popular. Um, so some of the challenges that we're up against, so we see that human rights is, is actually quite a limited concept in the minds of our audience. They associate it with a few abuses, but it's not a term that helps them understand the issues of the day or decide what's the right thing to do. Um, usually we see that the general public thinks of human rights as something that's for criminals or for um, poor people or for terrorists. Um, when, even when they sympathize with us, they see human rights issues as really heavy and political, maybe radical, uh, and above all, something really far away, something that you can't actually do anything about. And that's exactly what Calvin is saying, we actually may be inadvertently reinforcing that. For example, when we use a word like crisis, which brings to mind a natural disaster, it makes people, we actually, we talk about people's rights being abused we often make it seem like this big natural thing that's always going to be that way and can't be changed, whereas actually it's just a case of a policy being, being different and your government's actually bringing in different policies. And if you even think about just, it's not a criticism, but the, the slides Catherine used, the way we would all think of progress, less execution, less poverty, less famine, we just, we're so passionate about exposing abuses, bringing them to light, that we actually talk about our work in terms of the things we're against, not the things we're for, not the things we want to see. And so, actually what we can do is, there's a lot we can learn from the populace to do things differently. So what do they do? First of all, they listen. So they're using people's personal data to really understand their fears so that they give them, they, they sell what they want, their message, but in terms of the values of their audience, literally at the level of an individual. Um, and you know, a lot of the things that, that they do are things we could do actually without having a lot of resources. But we don't need to listen to people's fears, we can listen to their hopes. Um, what they also do is they put a really visual picture in people's minds. So when populists talk about going back to the way things used to be, that's a really simple way to communicate because even if people have a different sense of what, how things used to be, everyone has some kind of picture. But we're trying to go towards a future, what does a world without famine look like? It's very hard to communicate that. Um, what they also do is they pick wedge issues. They pick the issue that they know they can sell but that would bring people around to their cause. Um, not for nothing do you have organizations called Think Tanks. Uh, the military metaphor is coincidental. They're literally putting a mental tank uh, in the debate in people's minds. So for example, they over time build up concepts like this idea that the economy is a bucket. And if you take a little bit of money out of this economic bucket and give it to a refugee, that's less money you have. Or if you invest it in public services. For example, they'll, they'll look for examples of government waste and they'll attack that, building up this idea in people's minds that you know, the welfare state is a bad idea. Um, and by doing that, they're building this way of thinking about the world. What we can really, we need to build up our own way of thinking about the world and instead of engaging with those debates. Our problem is we're so rational that whenever someone brings an idea like that to the table, we can't help say, oh, maybe they're right. Let's think about it. Let's debate about it first just to make sure we're right. And then we sort of feel that, for example, I, I did this, I spent years communicating very aggressively, saying the other side was saying there's, you know, one in a hundred refugees could be terrorists. I have to prove that wrong. The public won't accept refugees until I prove them wrong. And I go out and argue that point, and I'm just reinforcing this debate. How many times have you seen NGOs with a headline, refugees are not criminals, journalists are not criminals? And the strong word in that sentence is criminal. And so we end up basically having a debate about whether or not refugees are terrorists. Um, or we have campaigns about whether or not civil society should be under attack or not. For us, it's logical. Of course, the civil society should be free. But if we're going to if we're going to go out on a campaign saying that, we're inviting a debate about whether or not civil society should be free. Um, but you know, I'm actually quite encouraged because I'm starting to find ways we can apply those lessons. And one thing 
problems they're really good at is challenging the status quo. And that's something I think we've been quite afraid to do for a really long time. We've been afraid to say, actually, we're quite in favor of, of migration. People move all the time, and they should be free to move. Actually, I quite, I quite like to live in a diverse society. I'm, I'm a citizen of nowhere, for example. Um, they're not afraid to actually say what they want and be criticized for it and have a debate around it. And they know slowly but surely they'll shift the mainstream to their position. And you know, another thing they're really good at is working together. I mean, isn't it funny that you see meetings of you know, nationalists who say that country should come first, but they'll all get together and really get along really well. Um, so there's one, one example recently that showed how you can apply these things um, beyond a progressive cause, and that's Ireland. And I know I live in Ireland, but so there's people who may be more familiar with it than me, but uh, in 2015, Amnesty International issued a report around abortion in Ireland. And at the time, we thought there was no hope of changing this. It's such a solidly entrenched um, case against uh, women's right to choose. Um, and I, I was thinking just about people I grew up with who really strongly believed, and just, just in a pub growing up, they would say, oh, no, I just I don't believe in abortion, I believe that it's murder, and I just, no matter how much I worked on the messaging, I just couldn't think of a way I would change the mind of friends I grew up with. And so we just built a strategy around having women tell their stories. And we had around 10 or 12 uh, women's cases in the report we issued, and only one woman had, was, was willing to put her face on camera because there's such a stigma around talking about that. But that really great woman did that, she told her story, and I trained up some of the other women to also do interviews. And as the, when the report came out, one woman, for example, came back to me and said, actually, you know, Thomas, I'm feeling really encouraged about this, I want to do more of interviews, I want to tell my story more. And something changed in Ireland in the few years after that, and that debate then became about women telling their stories. And another thing that happened was, the pro-choice side accepted that there was a conflict and you're not going to convince people with that really firmly held belief. So they would, it didn't anymore become this kind of fight between two moral sides. It moved away from this culture war to a more recent debate. And you can see that, for example, the United States, above all, that their policy seems to be basically trolling liberals. Just they want that sense of culture war, that conflict that forces people to choose sides. Uh, in Ireland, it was such a different debate. And it seems to be really framed around, this is about making Ireland being a modern country. Um, and, and above all, um, compassion was, was the key word. And but the, that campaign, is in, as in also with the referendum on uh, marriage equality, there was just so much enthusiasm behind it. There was this sense of belonging. So I, I heard the morning of the results, um, one anti-choice campaigner, for example, very kind of cynically saying, oh yeah, it was very cool and trendy, that campaign. People were queuing up to buy buttons. Uh, so they, they really hate enthusiasm, but that is actually a really powerful force that, that mobilized people, and that's something we need to think about. And actually, Ireland, previously, when there was a vote on the European Union, a referendum a few years ago, one of the best campaigns there was something that the British could have learned from, it was just called We Belong. That sense of belonging is so powerful. And so three things that any organization can do, no matter how many resources, uh, how much resources you have, one is just listening. And that's basically, you know, at a more scientific level, it's understanding the emotions we're triggering in people when we communicate. Um, Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. In terms of neuroscience, that's actually exactly correct. Because when you're triggering fear, you trigger a certain part of the brain that makes people defensive and more conservative. Empathy lives in a different part of the brain. So when we're going to people telling them how dangerous the world is, we're triggering that. When we're trying to engage in these debates that the other side are starting, we're living in that literally activating neurons in the brain for not just the fear, but also that way of understanding the world. Uh, and so there's that expression, the better angels of people's nature. We actually can build a strategy just saying, look, we're not going to engage in myth busting. We're going to build up the story we want to tell. And I think what we really need to do there is give our audience credit. In so many strategy meetings I'm in, people are always saying, oh no, but we can't we have to tell people why human rights matter to them. And that's how we always end up with this line of argument of this could happen to you. Imagine if you were a refugee one day and you were forced to flee. Um, you know, we, in Europe, for example, we spend ages trying to talk about surveillance and privacy. But you see, see human rights are relevant to you too. Um, but uh, no, you know, first of all, we're triggering the fear instinct there. But also, you, people also, their, their self-understanding is, is a lot more complicated than that, much more complex. People also see themselves as good people who want to help. Um, 
And so the way that this is that sense of community, community can also build values. So there's a great uh, book about the pro-life movement in the United States showing that people didn't come to the movement because of their values. They joined the movement because there was a barbecue in their community. They made friends and they went back. Uh, and then they, they, they felt part of that community. And I mean, if you really want to connect that to populism, Hannah Arendt, when she wrote about the origins of totalitarianism, actually seemed that loneliness is one of the key factors that prepares the state for fascism. The people felt they don't belong. And if you look at political parties as well, they used to offer so much more than just someone you vote for. They were you know, social services, like the German Socialist Party used to have like, what, 1.7 million members. Now they've become empty shells. And millennials, for example, studies show they're really involved in local causes. They just don't get involved in political parties. So just the action of people being involved builds up those values. Uh, and so maybe we don't just need to have people thinking about their own rights, but just empowering them to do good for other people, give, in, trigger that part of the brain of people thinking they're a good person. The second thing then is testing. Um, so just trying out different things. Um, trying out different ways of speaking about our values. So not engaging in debates about the economy or security. So you know, basically the other side will say, well, we'd like to accept refugees, but this is about the economy we can't afford to. Rather than saying, okay, look, no, refugees are good for the economy, we need to think about what is the context in which human rights policies are most likely to be accepted. And we don't know the evidence. That is going to be hard work. You have to try things out. But you know, even with Facebook today, there are tools that you can just run different ads at the same time and see which one does best. And so right now, we're testing out different ways of speaking about human rights, appealing to hope, to a sense of belonging, to a sense of fairness. We're just trying to see which narrative works best. So the way you could say this is moving away from name and shame to name and frame. So instead of saying, here are all the things the government's not doing, here are all the things the government's doing wrong, Come forward with our solutions. Um, we're challenging ideas. Think of the people who do TED Talks. So it's kind of, you can try and be a bit visionary and say, like, we have an idea of how things could be better. And then, you know, some people might come and say, oh, that's a crazy idea. But then we're, we're debating an idea. So if we say uh, sex without consent should be made rape in law everywhere, you know, if someone wants to come forward and say, oh, that's too extreme, we'll say, okay, but what's the solution then? And then we've set the terms of the debate. Um, Another way of thinking about the framing like that is the human rights movement, we're often talking about national values, and we need to convince our audience that human rights are actually part of national values. By doing that, are we actually saying that the national values are the most important thing? That the nation comes first? Actually, I mean, to me personally, I always think human rights is something much broader than that, that it's about people being able to stand up for people in other countries, and that it's actually, there are values that aren't national, that actually we're human before we, uh, we're national. So you could call it perhaps the humanity first framing. Um, and that, that kind of touches on also just the critique of human rights as just being about individual rights, but rather a way of, that society can be, can be run. Which brings me to the last thing we need to do, which is really put forward viable alternatives. I think we really struggle to show you what's our vision. We're so caught up again in saying the things we're against, the things we don't want to see. But if we're asking people to support and adopt our policies, we need to show them what, what, was going, what would the world look like the next day that after our policies are adopted. It's like if we're selling a product, but you don't tell people what the product looks like. Nike, for example, not only, they, don't, they don't even do that anymore. They say, when you do buy our shoes, you'll run faster, you'll feel better, you'll be cooler. <laughs> but we, right now, we're presenting our policies in a box. We don't show what the world would look like you know, once they're adopted. Amnesty International's um, vision is a world where human rights are enjoyed by all. What does that world look like? Um, but you know, with all these people criticizing human rights, if we can't actually have a convincing picture that when corporations or politicians go into interviews, they plan, no matter what they're asked, they're going to talk about their vision. And we very rarely can do that because we can't articulate, articulately talk about it. And so, but again, that's something that you could work with really expensive ad firms to do, but actually I believe the only way for us to get there is for all, all human rights people to think about this in, in their daily work. And also, um, basically, apply some creativity. So think, obviously we have to expose the abuse, but when we talk about the abuse, what's the alternative? Like, why is this abuse bad? It's because we want to, you know, we want, what is the alternative? What's the world we want to see without that abuse? Um, 
But I think to get there, we need to empower our supporters and our staff, volunteers, everyone to actually tell their story um, and, and basically embrace that creativity. So we need to move beyond this idea of a movement of experts, but actually a movement of values. Obviously, the expertise is crucial, but the expertise needs to be pushing those values. For example, just you know, how many times have you spoken to someone who's about to go home for Christmas, say, and you know, oh, I don't know how to speak to my relatives who voted for Brexit or who are Trump supporters or who are Orban supporters. We've got a whole movement of people that can share our values. They just don't know how to talk about them. Um, and so that comes back to that final thing, we just that sense of inspiration, of excitement, enthusiasm, of passion. We need to give people something that they can get behind. And again, in your science shows that in terms of the messenger, who the messenger is, is really important. People are more likely to take a message from someone that they can actually see themselves in. So what I still love that approach, basically, in terms of they go low, we go high, when, they, when the other side are trying to divide us, we actually have to unite. We have to find a different narrative, different values. Ignore the cleavage they're looking at and don't fight it, because then we're accepting what they want. When they look to dehumanize, we need a strategy to rehumanize. And it's really hard work, but it's just, it's a really simple thing. It's just about showing our audience the people we're trying to help and make them think differently about them. It's like little YouTube videos. So for example, a small group in Switzerland bought YouTube ads um, that would go run before a right-wing video. It would just be a refugee saying, hi, I'm introducing himself. Just little small strategies. It won't happen immediately, but it's a day-by-day -day fight to make people see other people as human, basically, and share our values. And then above all, instead of trying to trigger that fear and anger, see how it can trigger hope.